welcome to another show of this week. Looks like everybody is talking about peace. Our first story highlights an initiative aimed at supporting peace and reconciliation in the country at the community level. A National Peace Center has just opened its doors in an effort to promote peace and reconciliation across South Sudan. With community level reconciliation being key, the center will target South Sudanese who wish to take an active role in promoting peace and reconciliation. Addressing a gathering at the launch event, American Ambassador Molly Fee highlighted the importance of the center. So the purpose of this center is to provide a facility for people like Lorna, individuals and organizations, including NGOs and political parties, to meet and debate and learn. Here you will find a conference room, computers, a library, a facility where you can host meetings, conduct research, engage in training. We hope in this space you will make new friends, build lasting partnerships, and realize your dream of contributing to a brighter future for South Sudan. Because the United States believes so strongly that you, the people, must be given the opportunity to play a meaningful role in bringing the peace agreement to life, we wanted to make sure you had the resources you need to play that role. And as of today, this space is yours. Launched as the Reconciliation for Peace in South Sudan, the initiative will be run by the Catholic Relief Services with the grassroots support of the South Sudan Council of Churches and funding from the United States Agency for International Development. The center and the community level reconciliation initiatives are expected to be a platform where deep and painful griefs among South Sudan's diverse communities can be addressed. Today is about the people of South Sudan and especially inclusive and popular ownership of the peace agreement. Today, we seek to highlight the role of South Sudan's diverse communities in redefining and redesigning the country's economic governance and security arrangements. We also seek to highlight the role of individuals and organizations, especially the faith-based leaders in South Sudan, in healing the painful decisions, divisions in society. Funding of about $6 million will be dedicated to these reconciliation and peace initiatives over the next two and a half years and will hopefully reach 1.25 million South Sudanese. Speaking at the event, the Deputy Chairman of the Joint Monitoring and Evaluation Commission, Francois Solini, welcomed the community reconciliation efforts and highlighted that South Sudan's peace agreements signed in August would be availed at the Peace Center. This agreement is an agreement of and for the people of South Sudan. The, but the agreement is incomplete without the participation of the people. We must do more to ensure these ordinary citizens are consulted. I'm pleased that we are making some progress in this regard. The center will make available publications on global peace processes and implementation strategies for use by South Sudanese. The center will also offer materials including copies of peace agreement, legislative and official policies with a hope of empowering every South Sudanese to take a more active part in their country's future. This week on March 1st, the world marked Zero Discrimination Day aimed at promoting and celebrating everyone's right to live a full life with dignity. A regular press briefing at the United Nations mission in South Sudan shone some light on challenges faced by people living with HIV and AIDS. According to UN AIDS, three out of 100 adults are living with HIV in South Sudan. Speaking to reporters at a press conference in Juba, a UN AIDS intervention advisor said that the age group most affected are adults between the ages of 15 to 49 years. These are figures gathered in a countrywide study conducted in 2012, with the prevalence on average in the country at 2.7% and with some areas recording much higher percentages 
Indications are that the numbers may have been worsened by reports of rape and sexual assault since the conflict began in December 2013. With this rise in the numbers of recorded HIV cases, discrimination of people living with the virus has also risen. Coupled with feelings of same, discrimination has led to people not getting tested. For those who have been tested and are positive, not returning for life-saving treatment is the norm. 52% experienced judgmental attitudes and shaming. 23% were excluded from social events, including family, religious, and community gatherings. 30% exper ex experienced physical abuse due to their HIV status. 18% experienced loss of job or loss of income. 15% had to change jobs or were refused a promotion based on their HIV status. 14% were prevented from attending edu education institutions based on their HIV status. This is why UNAIDS marked zero discrimination day in South Sudan and across the world. With reports that nearly 2% of those infected with HIV in the country lost their jobs and 15% had to change jobs or were refused a promotion based on their HIV status and many others prevented from attending educational institutions based on their HIV status. Awareness on the need for zero discrimination is even more important. And as the fight against the discrimination of people who have HIV continues, journalists have been challenged to help in the fight against the stigma and discrimination against the people living with HIV and AIDS because HIV does not discriminate. In our next story, the clearance of unexploded ordnance and landmines continues to be essential. If not, landmine accidents will continue and some communities will have no access to their homes. The United Nations Mine Action Service has been conducting controlled demolitions of mines and unexploded ordnance which were left behind by warring parties in Bentu and surrounding areas. At recent exercises, the UN Mine Action demolished a total of over 150 kilograms of explosive remnants of war including anti-tank mines, rocket-propelled grenades and unexploded ordnance. A Mine Action Operations Officer in Bentu said clearing the dangerous remnants was aimed at creating a safe living environment for the population in the area and to ensure safe passage of organizations working in the area. One of our primary roles here is to make sure that the roads are all clear from any uh, contamination which would affect the humanitarian partners or the mission in doing their work. According to the UN Mine Action, there are a number of areas where unexploded ordnance have been left behind. After recent fighting which started in mid-December, forces involved in the fighting left ammunition in a number of areas like clinics, schools and around boreholes. The UN Mine Action Service have as a result been working in areas around Pariang, Ler, Abiyanom, Mayom and in Bentu to remove and destroy landmines and explosive remnants of war in these locations, including a number of other historically mined roads. This month we have dealt with uh, a large number of UXOs. No Over 150 kilograms of explosives has been destroyed through two demolitions to, um, and uh, we have many items, over a hundred items I believe, uh, ranging from anti-tank mines to UXOs, RPGs, unexploded ordnance, items that have been left behind by military after they've moved out of an area and other items which have not exploded after they've been fired. The, these co pose many problems for the local communities. They can be found around boreholes, around the clinics, around schools, and they're stopping people from returning home and having normal lives. So now that the peace treaty has been signed, it is our job to make sure that these are removed to allow people to return home and go back to their normal life and live the life that they want to live. It is hoped that these demining efforts will bear fruit and that targeted areas will be cleared with locations made safe and for the mine action teams on the ground, their work will indeed not stop here because mine education for communities is yet another important aspect in helping identify hazards on the ground.
from wheels to blades. In our day in the life segment and ahead of the International Women's Day, which is marked annually on March 8th, we introduce you to two young female pilots from Rwanda. I like flying, so every single flight, it's like, it's like a new one. So when I'm up there in the air, flying, I just feel I'm determined. told me to come here in South Sudan. First of all, I didn't take it as a challenge. I first take it as an opportunity. So I'm moving from, like, if I can say so, the local pilot, like being a pilot in my own country only, but I'm also going in other countries. And I'm also only flying, but also I'm contributing in making peace. The kind of help that I give is to support the civilians, if to take them to some places, I just take them. If to take their cargoes or maybe to support them, uh, like food or what, I know I'm the one near and just doing it. Take the tail bumper, if it has. I look around, like if. My helicopter, it's in good condition, like from blade to the wheel, to see that every, everything is good so that I will not jeopardize my safety and also the, the one that I'm carrying. From front to the rear of my aircraft, and when I just find everything is fine, and then now I just think that now the mission can be really now accomplished. How I managed to first fly, it's like I'm getting the whole picture of the flying. It's only not a matter of how strong you are, but the important thing which is situation awareness. So you must be aware of what's going around you before you can know, even think of lifting the top of My challenges are like the weather, so everything that can affect my visibility, so I, can, I cannot see well where I'm going, where I'm landing, and also that can affect the, my, the aircraft performance. Uh, my flight to Juba, Bokibor was, it was fine. The weather was favorable, so no bumpy, it was smooth. So I had a nice flight and my passengers also, I'm, they, I'm sure that they have a nice one. And flying over the Nile, the most amazing thing is its shape. Like when you are above, you're looking like kit for the, like from far away that your eyes can go to where you are. I attend the flight thinking I'll get the, uh, any mountain, but I couldn't get any mountain, so I just was like, what is this place? How is it like? I just continue to fly thinking I'm gonna meet another mountain, maybe just any short mountain, but I couldn't. It's like an, an opening to all girls that they can make it. They can see their goal, like I've tried to see my goal. 
show the world that you can just make it. And in all that success meaning, they can just follow their instincts. We leave you with our usual Voices of Peace. This week, we dedicate this segment to voices from South Sudanese women who highlight aspects of the South Sudan they want. Goodbye for now, and we hope you will join us again next week. The only thing we are asking for, we need the peace regardless of uh, what was the problem, regardless of what, from where this problem came from, we need peace. We need to rest. We never rest in our lives, so we need to rest, please. We are asking those sides to give us peace. We need the peace. In short time, today we need our peace to be there. This is what we are asking as women. We want to participate so that we create a peaceful South Sudan, a South Sudan which we want, a South Sudan where there are freedoms, a South Sudan where as a woman I can go to look for firewood and I'm not afraid of being raped, a South Sudan where as a woman I can get what I want. We the women, we are wise, we are warm, we are welcoming and we are the world. If we are the mothers of the whole land, why not demand for our right? And I think it's good to forgive ourselves for the peace and then healing and reconciliation. And let's forgive one another and accept ourselves as a Southern Sudanese.